Luscious Johnny Valiant, a storied wrestler and manager of champions, once told me about a wrestler who worked in the early 1960s, a giant among men who worked a horror movie gimmick. The mummy came out wrapped in thick white bandages, no little feat in itself, since back then there were no wardrobe departments to help him get into costume, and he would frequently become unraveled in the heat of a match. And you can bet it was pretty fucking hot rolling around in an outfit that made you look like a human tampon the very second your opponent's blood got on it. The part that impressed Valiant, though, was a bit of old-school corny stagecraft. Before he made his entrance into the ring, the mummy covered his chest with baby powder, and when he was in front of the crowd, delivering his best back-from-the-grave growl, he would punch his chest and put a cloud of ancient tomb dust in the air, ironclad proof that he was a legitimate Egyptian mummy, freshly risen from the depths of the pyramids, an archaeological wonder turned professional wrestler. I don't know if Ric Flair, generally considered to be the greatest professional wrestler of all time, ever saw the mummy work, but years later, he gave his blessing to another wrestler who works a from beyond the grave angle when he called The Undertaker the best gimmick of all time. That the selling of a dead man walking, a reanimated corpse, seems absurd on its face makes no difference in professional wrestling, the greatest of all entertainments. It reminds me of George Bush's compassionate conservatism gimmick, because the bigger the lie, the easier it is to sell. No matter, as I have written elsewhere, wrestling doesn't give a fuck what you think. It is the least self-conscious of sports, and is much like what Dostoevsky wrote about having faith. If you get it, no explanation is necessary, and if you don't, no explanation will do. I often use the example of The Undertaker for those doubting Thomases who question our great sport. You can't kill him, I say. He's already dead. And yet they protest, but it's fake. Well, I offer, he's a zombie. But they say somehow confused, it's fake, right? Clearly, reality is for those who can't handle professional wrestling. Unlike the mummy, the undertaker, a six foot 10, 300 pound behemoth does not employ baby powder when he makes his entrance. Instead, he has pyrotechnics that would make Gene Simmons genuflect, firebots, spark trees, and deafening explosions. More recently, a dozen hooded demons carrying torches and a jumbotron squealing with career highlights and a reel of otherworldly promos that prove his provenance as a bona fide dead man. Despite two decades of working from beyond the grave, The Undertaker has evolved. He began his career looking like a goofy mortician's apprentice on leave from a spaghetti western and imbued with some sort of occult superpower that was never quite explained. For a while, and for reasons I still do not understand, he worked a biker gimmick as the American badass and began making his entrance on the back of a chopper. But such is wrestling that the fans found it harder to believe in him as a real biker rather than as a real dead man. So he returned to the original shtick to which he has been loyal ever since, even though these days he wrestles pretty much just once a year at WrestleMania, which not coincidentally takes place in springtime right around Easter, the same time we celebrate another superstar's rise from the dead. These days, The Undertaker's choice in haute couture has evolved into a pastiche of Crypt Kicker, cowboy movie ghoul, heavy metal monster, and druid death merchant, combined with various leather boy tropes, which make him look in a certain light like the neo-baroque pope of Christopher Street. He is not anyone you'd want to tangle with in this world or the next. The Undertaker is the longest working wrestler in the World Wrestling Entertainment promotion, and most famous for his undefeated streak at the biggest wrestling rodeo of all time, the WrestleMania Grapple Fest, in which he was 21-0 before finally falling at the hands of another wrestler whose gimmick is what is known in the trade as a monster, although not of the same supernatural, reanimated corpse strain as The Undertaker. The streak itself stands alone in WrestleMania lore and has come to overshadow the poor souls who were laid to rest at the hands of this giant. Who even remembers The Undertaker's first WrestleMania victory, a win over the legendary Polynesian lunatic Jimmy Superfly Snuka? By the time Snuka got in the ring with The Undertaker, Snuka, once a main eventer, wasn't much more than a jobber, the fate of aging stars who lose favor with their bosses. And after his match with The Taker, Snuka was largely doomed to working high school auditoriums and low-rent fan conventions. Over the next two decades, The Undertaker was involved in some of the best and most brutal bouts of the era, including several casket matches and 12 bloody Hell in the Cell cage matches, most famously against mankind, seen here falling 15 feet through the roof of a steel cage itself, demonstrating that this is not just a reign of gimmickry, but also one of brutality. 
Across 21 years, The Undertaker has beaten a rogues gallery of superstars at WrestleMania. Among them, Jake the Snake Roberts, King Kong Bundy, Shawn Michaels, Kane, Triple H, World's Strongest Man Mark Henry, Batista, Randy Orton, Ric Flair, and at least one opponent who is now, in real life, dead. The former prison guard, Big Boss Man. Say what you will, but this is a very unforgiving sport. Cemeteries are filled with its heroes. The Undertaker notwithstanding, what has happened to the great goofy gimmicks that used to define professional wrestling? A quick look-see at the current WWE roster shows no sadistic Marine drill sergeants, no Middle Eastern terrorists, and no Jewish accountants. There hasn't been an unapologetic Nazi in years. Badass Russians went the way of Ronald Reagan, and there is a paucity of convincing heathens from the dark continent, a la Kamala the Ugandan giant, or Abdullah the Butcher, the madman from the Sudan, whose absence from the Wrestling Hall of Fame is a tragedy almost too great to fathom. A few years back, there was an evil clown, a voodoo priest, and any number of pimps and whores. There was even a guy in a multicolored chicken suit who made his entrance out of a giant egg, largely perceived as the absolute nadir of the entire racket. Gone are the great tag team gimmicks, untamed Samoans, lunatic hillbillies, and the greatest of them all, the apocalyptic punch of the road warriors. Ric Flair was right. What better way to keep the edge of reality at bay than a motherfucking zombie? But after two decades, The Undertaker is beginning to look something like a cross between Yul Brenner in Westworld and Margaret Hamilton in the final moments of The Wizard of Oz, which does not augur well for his continued longevity. The Undertaker is as old as the cemetery dirt he came rising out of, and he isn't moving with the same alacrity that he did as a younger dead man. And yet, he doesn't seem quite ready to return to the grave and travel into the great wrestling beyond of barca loungers and bad backs, dandling his grandkids on busted knees and humping a riding mower in a Texas suburb. But count on it. When he calls it quits, it will be accompanied by a fury of pyrotechnics and a thunderous soundtrack while fans weep, genuinely appreciative that someone, anyone, would quite literally sell their souls for their vulgar entertainment. But seeing as The Undertaker is already dead, he probably just doesn't care.